This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So let me uh, tell you a little bit first about the uh, accelerators. Uh, accelerators come in many sizes and energies. Um, very low energy accelerator is shown here. This is roughly 10 kilovolts. Some people call this a television. <laughs> if you go to the dentist's office and you get a an x-ray taken of your teeth, you actually sit in front of a little accelerator that puts out something on the order of a few tens of kilovolts to take a nice picture of your, of your smile as you're sitting in a chair being tortured by your dentist. <laughs> and then at the lower energy, still, you have these devices here, and they're used for vo vulcanizing our tires, for making radioisotopes, for important applications to society. In the lower part of the screen here, I will show you a couple accelerators that are more discovery tools. Here at Berkeley, we have one of the best in the world, uh, X-ray sources based on an, an accelerator beam goes around in a circle, and as it goes around in a circle, it emits light. At SLAC, back in the 60s, they built an accelerator which was two miles long. If you drive on 280, you drive actually over the accelerator. And so this was two miles long to reach 50 GV in our language, or 50 billion volt. And then at CERN, of course, there is the largest machine to date, 27 kilometer circumference, where they're colliding protons on each other to discover new uh, particles like the, like the Higgs boson and really do forefront discovery science in particle physics. And so when you think about the story here, Berkeley was founded, the Berkeley Lab was founded by Ernest Orlando Lawrence, and he's holding the first cyclotron in his hand. And about 80 some years later, people are building machines that are the size of a small country, at least a small European country, <laughs> with a stored energy in, this, this is megajoule, 300 megajoule. And to, to give you a sense of what that means, if you're sitting on the TGV to go to CERN, at 150 kilometers an hour, that represents 360 megajoule. If you're, I don't know if anyone in the audience ever has been on an aircraft carrier, I, I certainly haven't. But if these things go at 12 knots, it's 360 megajoules. So it gives you a sense of what the community has done to go from a handheld device to this gigantic machine with which people discover new things. So we asked ourselves the question, can we make them smaller again? And so if you think about what happened in computers, computers shrunk. And if we would be still in this era here of the supercomputer from 1954, I would have to have a gigantic pocket to hold my iPhone in, right? <laughs> in instead, we're now carrying around computers that are far, far more powerful. So the question that we look at is, can the same be done with particle accelerators? So how do we go about thinking this through? So increasing the power inside a convention accelerator, you could say, well, look, the particles get accelerated by electric fields. Just crank up the electric field to reach higher power uh, or higher energy electron beams. Well, eventually, it will lead to sparks in your accelerator. And I want to, I know my wife is in the audience. I want to tell her if the microwave oven doesn't work in the next few days, it had nothing to do with the making of this movie. <laughs> so here is a microwave oven, and you put some aluminum foil in it, and this is what happens. <laughs> so it's pure coincidence, honey, if, that, if, our, if ours doesn't work anymore. <laughs> so to think about accelerators in a different way, let's think about a favorite pastime for some people, surfing behind a boat. So here you have a brave guy surfing behind his boat here. So this boat is exciting a wave on the water, and he's actually riding that wave. So what we are working on is essentially the equivalent, but we replace, here you see again the same picture. You have your boat, 
traveling over the water, exciting this wave, and this guy is surfing on it. So what we do is we think of our surfers as electrons. Our boat is actually a laser pulse, and the liquid, the equivalent of the liquid that the laser pulse has to go through is called a plasma, and this is not the plasma that runs through your body. This is a very different plasma. This is an ionized gas. This is electrons and ions freely streaming around. And what you're doing is, when you send in this intense laser pulse, and I mean intense, it's of the order of, in my units, 10 to the 18 watts per square centimeter. So it's enormously intense. If you send that into this liquid of electrons and ions, the electrons get pushed out of the way by like a snowplow, and the ions are left unshielded. Now the ions pull the electrons back, and what you've set up is a clump of negative charge and a clump of positive charge. It's like a traveling battery behind the laser pulse. <laughs> and the fields that you excite in here are of the order of 10 to 100 billion volts per meter. So this is already broken down, basically. You don't have to do your microwave thing to break this thing down. It is an ionized gas. It is, per definition, already ionized. All you're doing is you're moving charges around and you're creating a wave to, to, to allow this, to, these electrons to surf on. Here are the electrons. This is the laser pulse. This is a simulation on our supercomputer. And behind the laser pulse, you see this wave. And the color change indicates the energy gain of these electrons. So we can actually simulate this. And of course, we did this in the laboratory as well. I know this movie went by really fast. But red here is 10 billion volt. And this is of the order of 6 billion volt. And this is done in a distance of about 20 centimeters. In fact, I never leave home without my accelerator. <laughs> here it is, if, in case I have to revulcanize my tires, create some radioisotopes, call me or find me after the show to, um, to discuss. This offers to be made. So now to do this correctly, you have to have some control because you have this wave. How do you get your surfers onto this wave? And that's the tricky part. So if you look at these guys here, they're beautifully riding this wave. We're exciting it. And we call these the injected electrons. <laughs> and then you have this unlucky fellow here. <laughs> He's injected out of phase. He ain't making it today. So we use these guys. And that takes really good control of all of these laser properties and plasma properties, et cetera. And so it takes a lot of work. We have the world's highest repetition rate, highest peak power laser here on the hill. This is a laser that produces about a million billion watts, but in a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. In fact, it produces it only for about 50 femtoseconds. So that's a zero, and then another 14 zeros, and then a five. <laughs> So otherwise, you would see the lights dim every time we fire everywhere in the Bay Area. That obviously doesn't happen because we store the energy and then we release the energy. And we do all of these gymnastics on the laser pulse. The other thing we had to invent was with our help from colleagues at Oxford University is this structure, like the one I have in my pocket here. This is actually a hydrogen plasma. This is a real picture of the real device, the hydrogen plasma. And you can see the plume flowing out here. This is life action. Laser pulse gets coupled in. And if you do things right, you get these ultra high energy electron beams. And we have right now the world record at Berkeley Lab, 4.25 billion volt in nine centimeters. So this is clearly a tabletop part. The laser, I grant you, that's not quite tabletop. But if you think about what we're doing is, if I would do to, try to do the same with conventional technology to reach 10 billion volts, I would need at least five football fields. To do what we did, we built this lab. These are, this is the laser here. This is the target chamber. 
And this is our friend. It fits in there nicely. And to put this on scale compared to the football fields, that's what it looks like. So, of course, when you think about these discovery machines, you also try to make sure that when you talk to your neighbor, you can actually tell your neighbor you're doing something useful, right? <laughs> so I was at a evening giving a lecture in San Jose, and they asked me, have you ever thought about putting an accelerator inside the body? And the reason you would want to do this is if, if you're so unlucky to have cancer, where they need to put radioisotopes in your body to treat the tumor, what happens is, if you look at the prostate here, you put your little, you have your tumor here and you implant radioisotopes, you'll irradiate not just the prostate, but you'll irradiate a broader bulk of the tissue that's all surrounding it. So what they asked me to do is, can you think of a way to build an accelerator that actually would go into the body, produce these electrons, produce the radioisotopes right there in situ, you pull your accelerator out and you're done. So we, we first thought, I must be honest, I first thought that was a little crazy, but even for me. But so we decided to think about it, and I have a brilliant postdoc and a, and a wonderful student as well. And so we decided, let's think about a fiber optic, a special fiber optic that can deliver laser power onto a special little tip here where the tip contains gas that you deliver in through this fiber and you make sure that your gas has a very sharp threshold. Think now about waves on the ocean. If you're sitting at the beach and you have a rock and the wave comes over, the wave is gonna break over that rock. When the water breaks, that's when the electrons get released and they actually can produce a little electron beam. So our dream is to build this thing, and this is meant to be a finger. I know this is a little bit confusing, but the rice grain right there, that would be the size of the accelerator. Right now, we have done the reverse of what people do that build airplanes. When you build an airplane, you start with a model, and then you go to the big scale. We're a little doing the reverse here, because I don't think any would, anyone wants to put our prototype in their body. <laughs> So this is scaled version so that you would see it. No, I'm kidding. We need to make it smaller, obviously. But this allows us to figure out how do you make a profile like this. And so this is really fun work to do because this would be an, an incredible feat of sort of engineering physics. And it really is a story of science. You start with a very lofty goal with a moonshot. And then you come to something that may be actually be very practical. So I like to end here with this same picture as I showed in the beginning, but this time with a provocative quote that I like to stir things up when I'm talking to my funding agencies or any, anybody else. Those that say it cannot be done should not interrupt those that are doing it from George Bernard Shaw. <laughs> Thank you.